Well, good morning. Are you excited to be in church this morning? We're going to sing. We're going to give God our praise. We're just going to give Him everything we have. He is our hope. He is our salvation. We're just going to sing to you, God. I pray that you would just hear the praises of your people, that you would hear our hearts as our voices open up. We love you, Jesus. Come on, let's sing to him. In your life, I find my strength, and in your truth, I overcome. In your pain, I lose myself, in your love, you turn my tears and sins into such joy and love.
that everything we need is found in you. And Lord, we just turn to you right now, here in this moment, we turn to you as our source of strength, our source of direction, our source of wisdom. We're coming to you, God, telling you we need you desperately. Move over your people.
the first week of the year, God, just barely in to the first week of the year, God. We want to sing this song to you. And church, I want to challenge you to sing this song to God, not as a church song, but as the prayer of your heart. If you want more, this isn't about not doing enough. This is about how good he is. And if, and if you want in your life, more of His Spirit, more of Him. We're going to sing this chorus one more time, and we're going to commit the entire year of 2023 to Him. There's no better time than the first weekend to make this commitment. So we're going to sing this to Him, and I want you to open your heart to Him. Let this be your prayer. Let's sing this together. Make me this. So make me a vessel, make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing, but all you have given me, Jesus, bring me.
in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus oh, Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over above every name, the name that under which every knee will bow and tongue confess that he is Lord. I feel like this song is not just another church song. It is a prophetic declaration over the lives of the people of God that there is a king who reigns over every desperate situation, every heartache, every prodigal child, every situation. There is a Jesus who reigns supreme over it all. And when we call on his name, things have to move. Mountains have to be flung out and demons have to run. The name of Jesus is all powerful and it is the mightiest weapon that we have on our side. It is the blood of Jesus and by his name that we have victory this morning. Church, it is so good to worship with you today. 
we're worshiping from, not from a place of defeat, even if Monday to Saturday and even this morning felt like you were taking losses and you were feeling that defeat. This morning we worship from a place of victory in the name of Jesus. Let's close our worship time with just one more prayer. Lord, we thank you for your victory. We thank you that by your blood and by the work on the cross, we can say today that we need Jesus for our family. We need Jesus for that desperate prayer in our heart. We need Jesus for that anxiety that has been riddling us in our sleep. We need Jesus over the heartache. We need Jesus over every situation. We thank you, God, that today it is not just uh, empty hope, but it is an assurance of your victory. God, we love you, and we put our whole faith in you this morning. And it's in Jesus' mighty name, mighty name, everybody said, amen, amen. You guys may be seated this morning. Community Christian Church, it is so good to have you here with us this morning. Whether you're joining us here in person, thank you. Joining us online, it is just an honor to uh, meet together in the house of God. We have a very special service. We're kicking off this new year with a brand new series, and I'm very excited to see what God has for us as we dive into his word and we put Jesus first to see what he has in store for this house and this church. Uh, over, these, uh, over the last several weeks, we've uh, had a, a special honor to be able to give and we've been able to see God move in some very special, powerful ways. Last week, we had the ministry of Key of Hope come and share. And how many of you were blessed by Key of Hope last week? I love being able to see what God is doing around the world and through some very special families and what God is doing uh, and for the least of these truly. Uh, I wanted to give this really quick testimony about our giving. You know, this church, God has blessed this church to be a generous church. And last week we were able to write a check to Key of Hope for $20,000 to accommodate their new vehicles to help their ministry expand. Sometimes, you know, the gospel, it is the heart change, but there are ways that the gospel goes when we give. The gospel goes when we give out of that generous heart. And what a special way to see the gospel expanded just through this very practical need being met. Amen. It's just good to be here with you guys. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to check out these video announcements, but I want everybody just heart, mind, soul. Let's lock in today for what God has. I believe this word today can change your life if you're willing to open your heart to it to receive. Amen. So why don't we check out these announcements and let's lean in. Hi, CCC. I'm Sean, and I'm here to share a few things for you to know today. Are you new to Community Christian Church? If so, we'd love to get to connect with you. The best way to do this is by filling out a connection card. You can find it on our website's homepage, cccsterling.org. Or if you're here in person, you can fill out a connection card at the Next Steps desk in our lobby. While you're there, we encourage you to take advantage of our meet and greet moment following our service today with Pastor Dan. He would love to meet you. He'll make sure you get a cup of coffee, answer any questions you might have, and he might even show you around the building. Just look for Pastor Dan near the Next Steps desk in the lobby following our service. Here at Community Christian Church, one of our traditions is to start the new year with a time of prayer and fasting. Starting tomorrow, we will begin 21 days of prayer, and we will begin with a church-wide five-day fast from this Monday to this Friday, including nightly prayer services right here at the church from 7 to 8 p.m. Then after that service this Friday, January 13th, we will break the fast together with a meal. So please bring your favorite dish to pass. Following that, we will continue our 21 days of prayer until Sunday, January 29th. Don't forget that you can find all the details regarding prayer and fasting and how you can participate with us anytime on our website. With a new year comes a new semester of life groups. Our life groups are one of the best ways to get connected with others at CCC and become a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. If you're not sure where to get started or how to get involved in a life group, don't worry because next Sunday, January 15th, we will host our life group rally days where you can meet and talk with the different group leaders and register yourself for whatever groups are right for you. 
But you can already preview our entire catalog of life groups starting today just by going to cccsterling.org slash lifegroups. Are you interested in serving at CCC but not sure how to get involved? Look no further than the Serve Board on our website. We would love to see you connect with the team and use your gifts to further the Kingdom of God. We are currently looking for some volunteers for our weekly food pantry. Pastor Dan is requesting some help from any men willing to volunteer in coordinating our distribution line of cars, picking up food outside in the parking lot. For more details and other volunteer opportunities, you can check out the serve board at cccsterling.org serve. Just submit the volunteer form and one of our ministry leaders will be in contact with you soon. That's all I have for you today. Make sure to stay connected with us on our website. You can see all the details and register for upcoming events by visiting cccsterling.info. We also encourage you to follow us on Facebook and Instagram for updates throughout the week. And if you have any questions or need any kind of assistance today, please visit our Next Steps desk in the lobby. Now get ready as we start a brand new January series with Pastor Tony entitled One Thing. Once again, good morning. Welcome to Community Christian Church. So good to have you with us. I trust that you enjoyed our worship time together. Just so great to be in the house of the Lord and feel and sense that much of God meeting us here on a Sunday morning. Are you happy you're here? I pray that you had a, a great start to the new year, that you had a wonderful holiday, and that it was healthy for you, and we'll pray that it will continue in the weeks and months to come. You know, exactly one week ago today, on January 1st, we all woke up to pretty much the same life that we had on December 31st. But then on January 1, just 24 hours later, the calendar changed numbers. Went from 2022 to 2023. Some of you stayed up and watched that. A new year. How many of you know that a new year can be different? And a new year has great potential and promise. Unfortunately, good intention and wishful thinking is not going to get us there. We have to be proactive. And if we want to see things change and things different in the new year, how many know we have to be willing to make some changes and maybe even a few adjustments. Uh, nobody following me? Yeah. So a new year is great, but it requires some things of us. And so if you're here this morning, and for you 2022 wasn't that great of a year, or maybe it was decent for you, but you're looking for 2023 to be better than last year, this year to be better than last year, then I have some really good news for you. And you've come to the right place. Because today I am fully prepared and ready to tell you how to make 2023 the absolute best and most productive year of your entire life. How's that for a sermon introduction? And when I say it, I mean it. I believe this year can be better than last year. I believe this can be a good year. 
but to make sure that I'm speaking to the right audience and I didn't get my wires crossed, how many of you want that? How many of you want this year to be an exceptional year, a great year? All right, I'm going to continue then with this message and stick with these notes because that's the majority of you. Let's begin with a passage of scripture. It's found in the book of Psalms, Psalm 27. And for the record, this is one of my favorite of all 150 Psalms. Psalm 27, a Psalm of David, just one verse this morning. And Community Christian Church lifers, you've heard me quote this verse countless times. Verse 4, Psalm 27, verse 4. David said, One thing, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold his beauty, and to inquire or seek the Lord in his temple. What a beautiful, poetic passage of Scripture. And right out of the starting gate, David tells us that I have this one thing. And not only is it pressing and paramount in my life, it has become my single greatest desire. That's what David tells us here. This is my greatest desire. And as you well know, desire, the word desire, means a very strong feeling of wanting. Something that we desire, something that we want. In the Hebrew, it's synonymous with passion, hunger, yearning, and craving. Passion and hunger, yearning and craving. That's what David meant when he used the word desire. Now, years and years later, recorded in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 22 and verse 15, just a short time before Jesus went to the cross, Jesus used the same word with the same meaning. He said to his disciples, Luke chapter 22 and verse 15, with desire have I desired to eat this Passover meal with you. With desire have I desired. You know, that's a pretty strange combination of words. But it's actually called a Hebraism. It's an expression from the Hebrew dialect, and it basically means, it, it literally means, the greatest desire possible. You can't have a greater desire than that. Something that you would be willing to die for. A craving, a yearning. It goes a lot deeper than cheeseburger and fries. Jesus said to his disciples, with desire, with great desire, have I desire to meet with you. And in Psalm 27, 4, David is expressing the same kind of spiritual longing. He says, my deep devotion and admiration for God goes above and beyond anything else I can possibly do. That's the kind of relationship that David had with his God. And it's not to say that David's life is perfect. We know better. We have read his story. And like the rest of us, we know he has some human flaws. But check it out. Psalm 27, verse 4, is not a stretch or an exaggeration. When David said, God is my one thing, that is precisely what he meant. It's what motivated him more than anything else. What got him out of bed in the morning was an opportunity, a new, brand new opportunity to meet with his God and to express his love, adoration, and worship to God. And friend, this is not a brand new concept or idea. We have been teaching this same truth here at Community Christian Church for the past 31 years. In fact, putting God first has always been our number one top core value. It's the G in grace. Remember that little uh, word acronym that we use to identify who we are as a church? In fact, uh, while we have the time and the opportunity, let's just review uh, that acronym grace. And I didn't give you a cheat sheet this time. 
So G, God deserves to be first. R, relationships matter. A, acts of service. C, compassion for others. E, everything belongs to God. You can see that on the banner in the lobby. This is the attitude and the mindset, the believer mindset that we've been teaching here for a good number of years. And at the very top of the pack is this whole idea that God deserves to be first, or as David writes it out, our one thing. He deserves to be our one thing. And my dear friends, who I love with all of my heart, and please believe me when I say that because it is the truth. This is the beginning of a new year. And I firmly believe that this message and this message series will be critical to how the next 12 months plays out in our lives. And so I am compelled to throw caution and diplomacy to the wind and tell you if the church is going to be the church, we've got to make some changes. And if we want to be recipients of the best that God has for us, then we have to make some changes. And that's not to say that we don't love God. I know that you love God. I know many of you desire to please God and honor him with your life. But something dramatic happens when you truly put God at the top. When God becomes our one thing. When we make him the reason why we're alive. Priorities change. Decisions and choices, they change. Motivations change. Accomplishments change. And they all move in a singular direction. And this God is my one thing mindset, it converts good and acceptable outward Christian behavior to wholesale and genuine spiritual transformation. I'm going to say that again. When we have God as our one thing, it converts good behavior, decent behavior, into spiritual transformation. And how I many know that's what the Holy Spirit is after in our lives? He's after transformation. He wants something to happen in our hearts. It goes well beyond good behavior. It's not just about more patience, more kindness, more generosity, more self-control, all very good objectives. But the main goal, the main ministry of the Holy Spirit is to help us become the people of God, made in his image and likeness, changed from the inside out. That's what God's after. In 1 Peter 2, 9, Peter put it this way. He says, you, who? Me, are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. This is the church, God's special possession, that you, who? You, may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. See, we are the people of God. We're the church of Jesus Christ. And we are designed to reflect his glory to the rest of the world. We're called to be salt and light. Remember those two brilliant metaphors that Jesus used during the Sermon on the Mount? That's who we are. We're called to shine the light of his glory. Now, earlier I made an outrageous statement. I, I know it. I said that with this message and with this series, we're prepared to help you make 2023 the absolute best year of your life. That's the goal to see things change this year, to watch God move in a spectacular way, to have our prayers answered, to see our families coming to the Lord, to watch our neighborhoods change and see God do something dramatic and something spectacular. And the formula for all that to happen is right here in Psalm 27, 4. God has to become our one thing. Serving him, loving him, obeying him, living for him has to make its way all the way to the top of the food chain. Not halfway there, not second from the top, all the way to the top. And how are we supposed to do that? Well, for the purpose of this message this morning, there are three main ways 
And they're all found in this one amazing verse. Psalm 27 and verse 4. A verse that you probably know by heart. A verse that you've quoted often. A verse that you've heard uh, me and many others talk about. Here it is. How are we supposed to make or ensure that this year is a different year, that this year is the best year that we've ever had. Three ways. Number one, dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Number two, behold the beauty of the Lord. And number three, inquire in his temple. Dwell in the house of the Lord, behold his beauty, and inquire in his temple. Pretty simple, right? Number one, this desire to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life has very little to do with church attendance when you look at it. When you read it and you incorporate it in with other teachings and other things that David said, uh, mainly in the Psalms, it wasn't like David was saying, if I had it my way, I would live in church. And I would go to church three times a day, morning, noon, and night. And don't get me wrong, weekly church attendance is beneficial. But this desire that David has goes a lot deeper than a one-hour church service. What David was saying here is I need God's presence in my life every day. In fact, he says I need his presence every minute of every day. I have to have it. And when you look at David's life, when you, when you study David's life, he acknowledged God's presence all the time. Even when he was making mistakes, his sins, his uh, shortcomings didn't push him away from God. He failed forward. And so he was always surrounding himself with the presence of God. Now, God's presence goes with us, but, you know, we can kind of push it away. David acknowledged it. He brought it close to him. David made sure that God's presence, that's what he meant when he said, I need that every day of my life. I need to dwell there. I need to live there. Now, years and years before David lived, there was a guy by the name of Noah. Remember that guy? Gandhi remembers him. All right, that, that's the guy who built the ark. Remember him? In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9, the Bible tells us that Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation, and Noah walked with God. I want you to see that. Noah walked with God. And remember, Noah lived prior to the flood that wiped out all humanity. Think about that for a minute. The scripture tells us that sin and evil was so out of control that God repented he made man and was compelled to destroy the earth and everything in it. And even though sin came knocking on Noah's door each and every day, even though he lived during a time just like today when there was outrageous immorality, ungodliness, shameful living, shocking political legislation, still Noah was able to walk with God. He experienced his presence even in all of that darkness with everything that was happening around him. The scripture says he was blameless before the Lord. He was a righteous man. He was able to get God's presence in and around him each and every day. You know, I have a morning alarm set on my phone. It's set for 8 a.m. It's not to wake me up. Usually I'm up by then. When my 8 a.m. alarm goes off, every single day, seven days a week, it reminds me to do two things. The first thing it reminds me to do is to just say thank you to God. I start my day regardless of what's happening, regardless of what I have in front of me, offering thanks to God, expressing to him a grateful heart, not for what he's going to do for me, not what I'm asking him to do by faith, but what he's already done. God, thank you for your goodness in my life. Thank you for your faithfulness. You have been true. You have, been, you, you have made covenant, and you have proven yourself faithful to your covenant. So I start my day thanking God, and then the second thing I do is I invite God's presence to be with me every day. 
God, I need your presence. It doesn't matter if I'm going to play pickleball or if I'm going, you know, to have breakfast with someone or I'm spending the next hour or so searching the scriptures. Lord, I need your presence with me each and every day, every minute of the day. And especially when the devil comes knocking on my door, lying to me and badgering me with temptation. And how many of you know that's an everyday occurrence for you and for me? Because the enemy just doesn't stop. In the Gospel of John, Jesus identified him as the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And every single day, he's going to try to steal your joy. He's going to try to kill and cast doubt on your faith. He's going to try to destroy your integrity and your Christian testimony. That's what he does. And he's good at it. That's why David says, I need his presence. I have to have it every day. I have to dwell there. And again, in Psalm 16 and verse 8, it was David who said, I have set the Lord always before me. Always. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Always before me means very near, in close proximity. David says, I, I bring the Lord in. I do the necessary things to make sure I'm surrounded by his presence and by his goodness. Psalm 16 goes on to say, with God's presence at my right hand, not only their fullness of joy, not only are their pleasures forevermore, but there's discipline and there's conviction and there's the ability to stay on track. That's what the presence of God does for us. It keeps us where we're supposed to be. People think when they do something wrong that they can't come before the Lord. When there's failure in our life, when we're making mistakes, when we make bad choices, it takes us a while to get back to the place where we have confidence, even looking in God's direction. But that's the time when we need him most. And David says, if I'm going to make God my one thing, that I need his presence. I need to dwell there each and every day. The second thing that David said is, I behold the beauty of the Lord. The King James Version uses the word gaze. Gaze means to stare and then keep staring. And it contains the element of adoration. In other words, David said, I continually remind myself that God is altogether beautiful. He's majestic in all of his ways. The God I serve is worthy of all my praise, regardless of the trial I'm going through regardless of whether or not he's answered prayer the way I've asked him to, or if there's been setbacks or there's been struggles. He said, because God is so beautiful, because he's so majestic, I will give him the very best that I have, and there's no sacrifice that I can make to God. There's nothing that I can give to him that's too great for my God. In one place in the book of 1 Samuel, David says, I will not offer to God that which costs me nothing. In other words, he said, if I'm going to bring a sacrifice to the Lord, it's going to be worth as much as I can possibly give. I don't have the time this morning to detail it out for you, but way back in the Old Testament book of Exodus, God instituted the Passover celebration to remind his people of their miraculous de deliverance out of Egypt. Remember that story? The people of God, they were slaves in Egypt 400 years. And one day God said, no more. And he laid out instructions for them in the book of Exodus to celebrate the Passover on a yearly basis. Here it is in Exodus chapter 12, beginning with verse 3. God told Moses, tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each year, pardon me, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect or without defect. The Amplified Bible says, the lamb 
you select shall be without blemish. So, as a part of the celebration, the Passover celebration, God gave some instructions to his people. And God says, I want you to bring to me, in remembrance of all that I did for you, I want you to sacrifice a lamb as a part of the Passover celebration. What kind of a lamb was God looking for? We just read it. Yeah, he was looking for a pretty good lamb. One as close to perfection as possible. No marks, no blemishes, uh, you know, defects. He, he wanted the, every single family around Passover time, and they made preparations in the month leading up to it, so he wanted all the families to gather together. It's Passover time. Let's go to the stall. Let's look through our herds and our flocks, and let's pick out the best lamb that we have. The one that's going to be of highest value. If we were to take that lamb to the market, this is the one that's going to bring us the most money. And they grab that beloved and beautiful lamb, the one that they know would be very costly for their family, but since it's God, they gladly bring this to the priest and they offer this lamb as a sacrifice to the Lord, thanking God for what he had done with their forefathers years and years earlier. And the people of God did this year after year after year. And it was a tremendous celebration, one of the biggest events of the nation of Israel. But then something happened to that idea. This concept of bringing the best that we have to God. You know, this lamb without spot or wrinkle tradition. You find it in Malachi chapter 1 and verse 8. Here's God speaking to his people. Years after he instituted the Passover. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? Do you see what was happening here? At Passover time, when the people went to their stalls, when the families gathered around their herds and they selected that lamb to bring to the Lord, it was no longer the most perfect lamb we can find. Now it was the one that would bring very little money at market, the one that had the least amount of value. The families were selecting the lambs that were crippled and lame and sick. Those that were leaning against the fence post, just about ready to keel over. They checked to see if there was even any life left in that lamb, and they said, hurry up, let's grab that one, and let's give it to God. We'll offer that particular lamb, because we, we have no, no use for it, it's not going to benefit us, why don't we just bring it to God? And so they were still honoring the Passover, they were still commemorating their exodus out of bondage, but their hearts weren't in it. They were just going through the motions and they were bringing to God the very minimum they could, just enough to say they had done it. Let me ask you a quick question. Do you see and acknowledge on a daily basis the beauty of our salvation? Do you think about that? When you consider what Jesus did for us on the cross and his love and his sacrifice, his willingness to lay it all down for us, does it drive you to your knees in thanksgiving? Or do you pretty much just take it in stride now? Has it become routine? something that we just take for granted. David said, if, one, if God is going to become my one thing, if I'm truly going to be able to have that testimony, then I have to gaze upon his beauty each and every day. Acknowledge his splendor, see him as he is, a magnificent God. And David said, I refuse to take for granted the goodness of the Lord. So,
dwell in the house or in the presence of God each and every day. God, I have to have your presence with me today. I, I need it desperately. I can't do this on my own. Two, gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Continue to admire and acknowledge he's worthy of all our praise. And finally, number three, inquire of the Lord in his temple. Do you know what that means to inquire of the Lord? To seek God, to pursue him? With one word, anybody? That's right. In simple terms, it means to pray, to petition, make your requests known to God, appeal before his throne. And friend, this whole idea of prayer is crucial to a one thing mentality, the kind of relationship that we're talking about this morning. Again, when you study David's life, when you read through First and Second Samuel and some of the, uh, the kings and chronicles, you will note that there is a phrase that is repeated often when it comes to David. You'll find this phrase in places like 1 Samuel 23, 2. Here's what it says. David inquired of the Lord over and over again. When he had a situation in his life that he didn't know the answer to, when he was seeking God's wisdom and his, uh, his guidance, when he was in a little bit of trouble or trying to make a decision, the very first thing that David would say is, to the priest is, bring me the ephod. He would call for the priest and he would want to know, what does God have to say about this? Before he made a decision, that was the difference between David and King Saul. Saul just made a decision, he used his own experience and wisdom and he just did it. David, he stopped, he slowed down, he waited on the Lord and inquired through the ephod what God was saying. Are you looking for a new job this year? Thinking about it? Or a college to attend in the fall? Have you been tossing around the idea of selling your house or buying a new house? Maybe changing churches? Have you thought about getting engaged or maybe even married? Have you brought this before the Lord? Have you inquired of the Lord with these matters, with these life issues? Have you just laid them before the Lord? Or have you concluded because God is for you that he'll favor any decision that you make? Friends, I can tell you on the basis and authority of God's word, he will favor you and he loves you. He, he's, he's fully committed to you. But he absolutely loves when we ask him, when we inquire of the Lord, when we're willing to take these matters that are so important for us and say, Lord, what do you think? Can you give me some guidance and direction on this particular issue? All right, just before we gather around the communion table, I, I wanted to take just a couple of minutes and detail our prayer and fasting schedule coming up this week. Now, many of you know this is something that we've done for the past 30 years. We began the new year with prayer and fasting. We're gonna do that again this year. I don't expect you to remember all of the details and information that I'm gonna give you right now, but like you saw in the video announcements, you can go to our website and uh, get that information, or you can refer to this little card that we passed out to you today on your way into the sanctuary. It has all the information on it that you need. Starting tomorrow, as a church, we are gonna be praying for 21 days. How many days? 21 days. So we're gonna to start tomorrow, January the 9th. We're gonna take it all the way to January 29th. 21 days of prayer. Now the first five days of the prayer time, we're gonna add a little fasting to it. So we're gonna be praying and fasting for five days, Monday through Friday. Now we've reduced the number of fasting days from 21 last year to five, hoping that it will encourage you to participate. You know, 21 days of fasting can be a little bit intimidating, but we're thinking five days are doable. And it's actually four and a half days because we're going to eat Friday night. <laughs> Here at Community Christian, we love to Daniel fast. Now you can fast any way you want. You can fast as short or as long as you want. But we're going to be Daniel fasting for five days, Monday through Friday. Daniel fasting basically means no meats, no sweets, no treats. 
for five days. Now, during the prayer and fasting week, Monday through Friday, being redundant on purpose, we're going to have prayer meetings here in this sanctuary every evening from 7 until 8 o'clock. 7 to 8 o'clock prayer times in the sanctuary every day, Monday through Friday. On Friday at 8 o'clock following our prayer time, we're going to break the fast with a meal. We're asking you to bring a dish to pass, and we're all going to celebrate together. Now, during the prayer times that we're having each of the evenings, Monday through Friday, we have specific themes, and I wanted to highlight those for you. Tomorrow, we're going to start off our prayer time in a place or a posture of repentance. I'm going to lead us in a time of repentance, surrender to God. That's what our goal is for tomorrow. Lord, we present ourselves to you. We're asking you to receive us and to receive our prayers. On Tuesday, we're going to go after the nation and the church. How many of you know the nation needs some prayer? But so does the church. If we're going to see anything positive happening in the nation, any changes made in the nation, the church has to be in the right place. We have to be discerning. We have to be on top of things. So we're going to be praying for that on Tuesday. Wednesday is going to be our family night. We're inviting you to bring your children, your students, uh, young people, everyone. We're going to be praying for marriages, for families. I believe Wednesday night is going to be a huge blessing for your family. Thursday, we're going to wait on the Lord in a little extra time of worship. So prayer and praise and worship. We're going to speak prophetically over the families of our church and just try to hear from God. And then Friday is going to be a celebration of hope. We're going to get excited about the goodness of God and expect some great things coming to us in 2023. And then at 8 o'clock, we're going to eat. We're going to break the fast and eat. I believe that it's going to be a great day and a great week for us. It's going to be a good prayer time. I don't expect you to remember everything I just told you, but I am asking you to get fired up about the prayer. I want you to be excited about what God can do as we as a church come before him in prayer. And so I'm going to throw out this challenge to you. To every member of Community Christian Church, I'm going to ask you to make at least one evening prayer meeting in addition to the free food night. <laughs> By all means, come on Friday celebrate with us. I'll look forward to having you here. We're going to have a lot of food. But one other day other than Friday, I'm going to ask you to come. We've put a lot of time and effort into these prayer meetings. I believe they're going to be a blessing to you. And if an ESPN analyst can say a prayer on live TV, and if football teams can gather together in the middle of a football field before a game and pray, that should inspire us to spend some time in prayer. So I'm going to ask everyone this year to participate. Maybe you've never prayed before. Maybe you've never come to a prayer meeting. Let this be a unique experience for you. One hour, that's all we're asking, 7 to 8 o'clock. I believe God is going to honor us if we fill this place inquiring of him and seeking him for the new year. All right, let's bow our heads for prayer and prepare for our communion. Father, we thank you for the potential of this new year. We lay it before you, Lord. For some, 2022 wasn't that great. For others, it was a good year. But Lord, we're asking for these next 12 months to be the most spectacular, productive, best year of our lives. And Father, we know that if we're rightly related to you, if we do the necessary things to put you where you belong, at the very top, you will honor, Lord. You will open the windows of heaven. You will bless us in ways that we could never comprehend. And so we're asking, Lord, we're asking that you would move in our hearts that something would be different this year. And this next week, Lord, it's going to be over before we know it. Just these next five days, I want to extend the prayer time, but these next five days, Lord, critical days of prayer and fasting for our church. We ask, Lord God, that you would anoint our communion time together. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
You know, the scripture says it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after supper had ended, Jesus took the cup. Again, he gave thanks. He passed the cup to his disciples. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you declare the Lord's death till he comes. On two separate occasions during the communion time with his disciples, the, the very event that Jesus said, with great desire have I desired to, to share this time with you. On two different occasions, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Not once, but twice. He didn't just throw that phrase in there. He wanted his disciples, he wanted you and I, to remember what happened that day. To recall, to review in our minds, to think about what we call our gospel. I asked you a question earlier in the message. I'll ask it again. Do you see the beauty in our gospel message? When you look at the cross, what do you see? Do you see the agony and the suffering and the beating and the horrific death that Jesus suffered and he did all that and more? Or do you see the beauty of our salvation? That on the moment Jesus breathed his last breath and made that sacrifice because he loved us so much, the scripture says the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and we are allowed now into the presence of Almighty God. Friends, that's what beauty is all about. We don't have to call for the priest anymore. We don't have to say, bring me the ephod. We have access to God's presence each and every day. Do we take advantage of it? Do we understand how powerful, how wonderful his presence is? God, I need you. I have to have you. It controls our behavior. It corrects the way we live. It helps us. It convicts us to do the things that we're supposed to do. His presence, not in a condemning way, but an engaging way. Friend, when I look at the gospel, yes, it's, it's horrific at times. It's, it's hard to see it. We want to turn away from the pain, but it is the beauty of our salvation. It's why we're in right standing with God. Salvation begins and ends on the cross. On the cross. I pray that if nothing else, you take away from this particular time together the absolute need to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to behold his beauty. He is a majestic God. He's worthy of all our praise. And so, Father, we thank you. We thank you for sending your son. We just celebrated that a couple of weeks ago, Christmas time. Thank you that you became a man for us. And then a few years later, you walked the most difficult walk anybody could ever make and you went to the cross and you established for us the beauty of everlasting life and the blessing of knowing you here on earth. I'm asking, Lord, that you would do something unique and uncommon among us as a church. That this element of one thing would resonate in our hearts. That we would be willing, Lord, to make the necessary changes you know, sometimes we make resolutions and we say, okay, we're going to make things different. Lord, this year, we're asking you to help us be different. We know we can't change on our own. Holy Spirit, you're responsible for the transformation. We're just presenting ourselves to you. 
And we're asking you, Lord God, to do the work by the power of your spirit. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your love. Lord, we want to make you our one thing. Let's take the bread and the cup together. few moments. Just tell him how much you love him. Commit this year to following after him. In your own words, tell him what he means to you. Not just the lyrics from a song. Tell him what he means to you. Just lift up your voice, church. Who is he to you?
great God we serve and I'm so encouraged this morning because I really sense that this is where we're at this is our desire as a church we want to know him we want to make him our one thing thank you so much for coming and being with us today if you've never met Pastor Dan I'm sure he would love to meet you just swing by the next steps desk I'll see you tomorrow night at seven o'clock God bless you go Lions